All right, it is time for our next exercise. We just got, got through playing with layers and compositing. We're going to continue to practice with layers, and we're going to continue working in Photoshop. But this time, instead of creating pixels and manipulating pixels, we are going to create vector shapes within Photoshop. And vectors, we'll, we'll learn a lot more about later. But think of it now as just cutouts of paper, right? In order to decide how we'll arrange our cutouts of paper, we're going to start with an image that we like. It can be a photograph, it can be a painting, it can be an art historical object. And then our task is going to be in this exercise not to create something original, but to simplify the thing we like with the limitations of just solid color shapes, what we'll call vector shapes. So something as complicated as this can be simplified into shapes. And then as an extra, I'll show you how you can fill in those shapes with gradations, just like we played with coloring in the last assignment. So no matter how complex an image is, if you squint, you can kind of see the, the strong uh, colors and strong value shapes that lead your eye around that space in the way that they do. And because it's an exercise, it's okay if we don't finish this. It's important that you're exposed to the process and understanding the tools. Now, with enough kind of precision, you can get a lot of detail even in just flat shapes. And that's going to show us that even when you just have flat graphics, things like logos or one color designs, they can be fairly complex, right? So this is one that the student worked quite a bit longer than the time allowed in order to make it a portfolio piece they were happy with, but they were able to match every wrinkle and really customize. And I actually like this better as a graphic, like I would like that on a, a poster more than this. So shapes can be pretty powerful on their own. And they can be silly. And you can have some kind of creative choice as well about what you leave in and what you take out. Okay, so that's the idea. So how do we get started? Well, you first you find an image you like. It doesn't matter how big it is. And then you save that image onto the desktop. It's important that you're aware of the image as a rectangle. Because we're going to be matching that rectangle and matching the way that image uses the space. So even though this has white shapes behind it, this isn't a free-floating illustration. This is very carefully contained within this rectangle. Notice how the, the little bits of rock are cropped at the edges. And that's what gives it its power because the negative shapes of the white are very intentional. right? And I, I chose this one because it's not that many colors. It's all about shape, right? But whatever you choose, something will work. And you can always see past student examples and instructor examples in PhotoBucket. So what I've done is in our new master folder here, I've created a folder for exercise one. And so now we're going to start a new folder for exercise two. You can organize your folder files any way you like using these finder options. I like to view them always as icons, and I like to arrange them usually by name, right? so that all my videos here are numbered, all my references here, and then my PSD file, that's the one I'll mark green. So if I ever wanted to revisit that project, if I wanted to make something print ready from that project, I would always go to the, the high resolution PSD file that has all the layers. And that, that file is almost 200 megabytes, right? So I don't want to delete that, I want to keep that, it is a whole lot less than the things I uploaded to the internet. You know, that's three megabytes. And so I'll usually mark that as green. Exercise two is empty right now. Everything we work on today, we'll save to the desktop, but then at the end of class, we'll move into our exercise two folder, put it into our master folder, and our master folder will go into our documents folder. 
so that our desktop's clean for the next student. Okay, now what we're going to do is actually open this file up in Photoshop. So we haven't done this before. So how do you open an image in Photoshop? You can right click it and say open with Photoshop. That's usually what I do. You can also click on the image and then drag it down to the icon of Photoshop in your dock. A lot of people like that method, but I find that it's a little too prone to error and you can accidentally open it up with another program, but that will work. Once it's open in Photoshop, let's uh, see how Photoshop gives us information about an image. Because we didn't create this, this is something that already existed. So if you have your rulers turned on, and I recommend you do, Command R turns them on, you'll see in inches the physical format of this image. Some of yours will be very small, right? But you have no idea how many pixels per inch it is until you go to image image size. So if you open up your image image size, the physical format of this, if I were to print it at 100% scale, it would print at six and a quarter inches by eight and a little bit, right? And you can see that on the rulers. So that would fill up, that would fill up a good chunk of a regular letter size piece of paper. The problem is its resolution is only 96 pixels per inch which is a good screen resolution. It's a little bit higher than standard screen resolution, but it's not a good print resolution, right? Professional print resolution is 300 or higher. So once we know that, we can change it. So we are going to change it here, and we are going to resample. So whatever your image is, I want you to change it to be 11 inches at its smallest measurement. So my smallest measurement is the width. I'm going to change that to 11 inches. You're able to do that if you have this resample box checked. So that gives me an image that's 11, and then the height automatically was locked in proportion, changes to over 14. And then we're going to change the resolution to 350. We're going to make it professional print resolution. This is our lab standard, 350 pixels per inch. You're going to notice in the preview, it's going to make what was sharp really fuzzy because we're forcing the computer to make up a lot of pixels. That's not a good thing to do. But we have a reason. Okay, so now you can see all this digital noise that comes from making one pixel into hundreds of pixels. Right? The computer can make up information, but it's not good at it. Okay, why is that important? Well, when we start creating our vector shapes on top, we want them already to be at a high resolution. <coughs> What's the next step? Make a new layer on top of your background, just a new blank layer. And we're gonna fill that layer with one solid color. And usually the easiest way to do that is to just pick a solid color that is basically the background color of your image. So if it's a sunset, it might be all orange. You know, if it's a forest landscape, it might be all green. How do we fill in an entire layer? We go up to edit and fill. We'll be doing this over and over again through the semester, but this is better than using the paint bucket or something else. So you select the new layer, go to edit, fill, and mine's easy. My background's white, so I'm going to fill in this new layer with one of the presets, which is white. But if yours is something other than white, you can go up to color, and then you can choose the color with this color slider. And if you want fewer options because you have trouble making decisions, you can select only web colors. <laughs> and that's not actually a bad way to go for this project, limiting your options here. And white's one of those options, so I can do that too. Okay, that will fill the entire layer up with that solid color. Then what I want you to do is to take the opacity of that down to about 20%. Okay, so this is like putting a tracing paper, sometimes a colored tracing paper, in my case just white, on top of your image. Now every other layer that we make, this is your, your limitation for this, can only be a shape tool layer. And that is how Photoshop deals with vectors. 
The problem is Photoshop can't output vectors, but it can create them, right? So we go to the very bottom side of our tools and you'll see the rectangle. These are the shape tools. So if you click and hold on that, you'll see the different options in like the drawer for the shape tools. And you can pick one of these basic shapes. I'm gonna choose the ellipse tool because I have a lot of round shapes here. And I'm just gonna drag and drop a big round shape. Right? It's automatically gonna fill in with the default properties. The default properties are to fill with black. This vector shape is filled with black and it has no outline. But all I need to do to change that is double click on the shape layer icon and I can choose a new color. Then when I hit OK, you're going to see that just like smart layers for our compositing had a little icon in their layer window, shape vector layers will have a little icon. It looks like a square with, it looks like a transforming box with little uh, squares in the middle. That's to show what are called anchor points. So let's look at what a shape layer really is. So when I select that layer, you're going to see a blue line around it. It's very subtle. And when you make a new one, you'll see that blue line. That is what's called a path. It's just showing you what cuts the shape out. What's amazing about vector shapes is that they are not tied to resolution. So right now it's showing itself at 350 pixels per inch and you can see how it, it renders that, that edge. But if I grow it, if I free transform that shape with command T, I can grow it, I can warp it, I can stretch it and make it a new shape. And as long as it stays a vector layer, a shape layer, it will always re-render to be as clean as possible, no matter how much I grow it or shrink it or change it. So your only limitation for this project is you can only use vector shapes. And our goal is to cover up our original. Let me put everything back here. And I'm going to start with the biggest shapes I can. And then how do I place them? Well, I use just like what we did with the cartoon jumble, command T, rotating, scaling, and then if needed, warping. To get an approximation of the shape I want. I'm going to try to keep mine pretty simple. Okay. And then to see what you have, just toggle on and off that background layer. So, so far I have that. <laughs> now I want this kind of pink band. So what might I do? I might pick a different shape, maybe the rectangle tool this time. Make a rectangle, but change its color by double clicking here and picking a different color. Or I could steal it directly from my image as well. Whenever you have the color selection in Photoshop, if you move on to an image in Photoshop, it will change to the dropper tool. And that will steal colors from the image itself. All right, now I'm gonna do Command T. And I'm going to use distort and skew to get the points of this where I want them. Right. And then I need to curve the bottom. The only way I can curve the bottom is to do command T and then right click and warp. So how do you turn a rectangle into a more complex shape? You use warp. And you can see those anchors now. I've just added anchor points. I've made it a more complicated shape than a rectangle, which only has anchors in the corners. Okay, now, just like layers in compositing, I can move these cutouts on top of each other or below each other. Right? So instead of trying, it wouldn't make sense for me to try to make this curve match that curve. 
Instead, it just makes sense for me to put this piece of paper under that 